and legal action. Those might be bad acronyms for you. All right, so that you now have this thing called an estate that could be a fee simple absolute, or it could be a fee simple determinable, or it could be a fee simple condition subsequent. Uh, if, if it's not absolute, it is reduced one of those powers. Now, I get a question a lot, and you may be asking me this. If this guy that bought this fee simple condition subsequent that does not allow him to subdivide it, can he sell that property down the road? Yes, he can. But remember, you can't sell what you didn't have. So he could not sell it to a developer and go, well, I didn't have the right, but I'll pass it to you. No, I didn't get the right to subdivide it. And therefore, he, he can't sell the right to subdivide it. Theoretically, he could pour more water out and put another condition. And every time you add a condition, what happens to the value of the property? It actually goes down. Because you have less and less buyers that want that, that now have five conditions. Oh, I can't subdivide it. I can't build a racetrack. And I can't, you know, do whatever because subsequent owners just kept adding stuff. It's possible, but stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry. Was that out loud? All right. It's possible, but you can't sell what you didn't get. So the new owner on this subdivision uh, requirement or non-subdivision requirement can't sell it to another party with that con uh, ability there. He, he didn't buy the ability to subdivide it. He can't sell the ability to subdivide it. Now, it is entirely possible that we do not sell all five rights. How about that for confusion, right? So let's go back here real quick and talk about those five rights that with a bundle of rights. We have the right of control. We have the right of disposition. We have the right of possession. We have the right of this thing called quiet enjoyment, which remember is to be left alone, no third party unjustly coming. And we have the right of exclusion. And we talked about a fee simple. I transferred all five of those to some degree. Well, I'm actually going to not transfer the right of disposition to a person. That is called... A life estate. A life estate. So for the period of that person's life, they have all of the rights except the right of disposition. They cannot get rid of the property. They can't lease it out. They can't sell it, and when they die, it cannot go in their will. So let's do an example that might help understand how this works. So what you have is this rich old man that has a spoiled brat child, but he wants the kid to have a house, so what he does is he deeds the property or gifts the property to the child as a life estate. So the question is here, who owns the property? He owns the property. It was deeded to him. He just didn't get all the rights. He can have wild parties. He can do whatever he wants with the control. He has the right to be left alone. He has the right to keep people off. But what he cannot do is get rid of the property. Now, they use a really bad word here uh, that sometimes confuses per people because we haven't got to this word yet. But that person's called a life tenant. It is not the word tenant like you're thinking of that we're going to use in the leasehold estate with a lease. Tenant here in this case just means he's the one possessing the property and he's possessing it for his life frame. Now, when this person dies, 
that property will automatically go back to the original person that gave him to them. All right? That is called a remainder interest in the property. <laughs> no, it's not. Raymond, you moron. <laughs> it's called a reversionary interest. Duh. What does the word revert mean? Go back to. Go back to. Or, here's what I was thinking. It could go to another person or a trust fund or a donation or anybody. Anybody other than the original person. It doesn't matter who. Anybody other than that one person is called a remainder interest. And these people are named when this life estate gets created. This is called a conventional life estate because it deals with the life tenant and it's the death of the life tenant that signals or that transfers this property either back to the original owner or to some other person. That is called a conventional life estate. All right. There is a remainder interest and there is a reversionary interest in this. Now, <clears throat> there is a second type of life estate that deals with the transfer of the property based upon someone else's life other than the life tenant. It is called pure author of e. This is French, that which means by the life of another. And it's another person other than the life tenant. So <clears throat> the best way to do this is just to show you the example so that you get it. Now, side note, sidebar real quick. There are a lot of cases where I try and use the most simplistic case to prove a point and understand that you guys are going to actually have a bunch of questions that may be so in-depth that it doesn't really matter. Hold on, you'll see what I mean. So, well-to-do family has a child that may be mentally handicapped and cannot take possession of real property because we haven't got to it yet, but a contract requires that a person have sufficient mental capacity to understand. A lot of courts have determined that people with mental hand handicaps can't take property because they can't enter into a contract. Okay, so don't argue with me on that. That's just how it is. They want their child to be taken care of. So what they do is they leave the house in a life estate to a nurse that takes care of the child for them. All right. Now, here's where I was talking about simplicity, because a lot of you guys are going to go, well, what happens if the nurse dies first? Or what happens if the... It's not really a nurse. It's more of a trust. And I don't want to get into trusts yet with trustees and beneficiaries. We will. I just don't want to do it now. So for the simplistic understanding, understand that they give it to a person, this nurse. This nurse takes care of the, the child. This nurse is, in fact, the life tenant. She is the owner of the property or the trust, if you want to get that way. But here's where the pure autre vie fact comes in. It is not the death of the life tenant in this case. It's the death based on some other person that triggers the transfer of the ownership. So in this case, <clears throat> if the mentally handicapped child 
would pass away. The nurse loses the ownership, even though she may still be alive, because it's not the life of the life tenant, it's the life of another that triggers the sale. And you're still back into the same concept here of reversionary. If it goes to someone else, it's remainder. Anybody other than the original person. So an ordinary life estate it is the death of the life tenant that triggers the movement. In a pure octra V, which literally means by the life of another, it's the death of another that triggers the movement. All right? It's not the death of the life tenant. It's the death of another. That is called a life estate pure octra V, by the life of another. Now, if it goes to the remainder in either one of these cases, they will then, in fact, get that right of disposition that comes to them from when the life estate was created by the old man there. All right? So that that remainder person actually now has all the rights. Now, understand that a life tenant does not have the right of disposition. I don't know how many times I need to say this because there are some trick questions on the exam that's going to ask you about the will and what property goes into it. Can this property go into a will of the life tenant? The answer is most assuredly no, because that's the whole thing of life estate. Once that person dies, that property is already designed to go somewhere else. And it was designed here at this process by this person that says when that person dies, it comes back to me or it goes to Texas A&M uh, as a donation. All right. So it does not go on their will. Can't go on their will. That's the whole definition of a life estate. Now, there are some legal life estates that we're going to deal with. And these are laws that actually protect people that are traditionally married under the eyes of the law. So there are the dower and the curtsy right. Typically, these are used in states, and I think Indiana just went away from this. Uh, they now use common property. It, it, it's, it's not common property law. There's a word for that, shared property. The dower and the curtsy rule, which is almost always used together so that you never hear it called the dowry law or the curtsy law. You almost always hear it called the dower and curtsy law. The dowry is the interest of the wife in the real property of her deceased husband. All right. So when my father passed away, my mother became the sole owner of that property. The curtsy is just the opposite of that. It's the husband's interest in the wife's property. Now, there are states that have what they call community laws and separate property laws. Now, understand, while you are legally married in the eyes of the law, and I say it that way because I want you to understand that some of these rights only protect married couples legally, not friends or partners living together. Even if you're living together 50 years, if that union is not recognized by the state, some of these laws don't protect them, which is one of mainly the reason that you see a lot of these same-sex marriages that want to be married, because there are legal protections for them for technically being married, whereas being best friends living in the same house for 50 years will not protect them for this, all right? 